How many of you in the audience have a smartphone with you right now? You know, an iPhone or an Android phone? It's everyone, right? I want you to imagine uh, that right now, there's a Russian company whose entire business is based around the idea of developing a kind of digital burglary tool. And they go by the name the NSO Group. Uh, their product used to work like this. Uh, they'd send you a time-sensitive text message with a link in it, uh, something that they think you're likely to click, uh, like a package delivery notification or uh, an alert that one of your family members has died. And these are the funeral arrangements. Uh, and are you going to be there? Uh, and if you click this link, uh, and, and because they can try 100 different times in 100 different ways, uh, eventually everyone does, your phone now belongs to whoever sent you that message. You have been hacked by this product. Now, the scary thing is because of refinements in this practically criminal product, uh, and it has a real name because this is a real life example, uh, it, it's called Pegasus. Uh, it's now being reported that they no longer need you to click anything. Uh, no user interaction is necessary. All they need is your phone number and they can hack your phone. Now, from that point on, everything in the entire history of that phone, they can instantly and immediately copy. And everything that happens on your phone from that day forward, every place you go, everyone you call, everything you read, every photograph, or because they can turn on your camera and they can turn on your microphone whenever they want, not just when you want it, everything that simply passes by that device, everything your phone is a part of, they are now a part of. And I want you to reflect on that capability and the nature of it being created and provided by this you know, Russian enterprise. And think about this from the legal angle. In their defense, they say they only sell this under contract to legitimate customers, only to law enforcement agencies, only to police, only to governments, and only for the purpose, under the contract, of targeting terrorists and criminals. Does that sound better? So many people today around the world in developed societies, right? We're not talking crazy authoritarian regimes. We're not talking Saudi Arabia, China, Russia, North Korea, you know, Iran, whoever you don't like. Uh, but we're talking about France, we're talking about Germany, we're talking about the United States, we're talking about Israel. Uh, they believe the rule of law and the legality of a thing is the beginning and the end of the conversation. But I want to remind you that the legality of a thing is very different from the morality of it. If a company sells a product with a single purpose, breaking into the devices relied upon by private individuals from you to journalists, to judges, to, and I'm not making this up, the president of the Mexican Senate, was in opposition at the time. How can this be the kind of situation we want to find ourselves in? Their only product is access to other people's belongings. Their only product is access to the things sitting in your pocket right now. And the most important thing to understand out of anything I'm gonna to say tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is this. Under all these laws, this is not a crime. The business model of commercializing public insecurity is the biggest threat to the future of cybersecurity that no one is talking about. We know about Facebook, we know about Google, uh, we know about all the telecommunications networks uh, and their willful collaboration with governments even beyond what the law allows. But this is coming and it's coming quickly because even if you trust Israel, even if you trust French companies to do the same thing, these companies do not have a monopoly on this business model. Russia is doing the same thing, China is doing the same thing. And we are creating a dynamic in which the insecurity of critical infrastructure is profitable. These are the things that nobody wants us to know, but everybody needs to know. And it is this principle that's all too easy to forget in our comfortable lives of accepting risk on an individual level in order to improve things on a collective level that moves us toward a better world. Now, this question that I ask you tonight, you know, is it better, is it worse? Uh, what's going on with surveillance? Uh, are things improving? Um, is not the real question. The question that I asked tonight should be very familiar because you heard it five years ago. This wasn't about surveillance. Surveillance was the mechanism of discussion, but the fundamental topic was democracy and the disempowerment of the public. The fact that we are being transformed from citizens, partners to government, instead to subjects of it. The world that we live in is one that we did not design, we did not approve, and we do not control. The question, ladies and gentlemen, is what are you going to do about it?
they already know what you're looking at on the internet, right? Uh, they already know uh, where your phone is moving. Now they know what your heart rate is, your pulse is. Five years later, the coronavirus is gone. This data is still available to them. They start looking for new things. Whenever there is a crisis, uh, rationality uh, exits the room. And you have uh, a policy that is being driven by a panic in the pursuit of benefits that at the time are theoretical. They said these things uh, would work. They said they were necessary. They said they would be beneficial. We don't want to do them, but the threat is so great that this is the only way that we can really counter them. When we see emergency measures passed, uh, particularly today, uh, they tend to be sticky. Um, the emergency tends to be expanded. Uh, then the authorities become comfortable. They start to like it. Uh, and the original emergency passes. Coronavirus yeah. is gone. It's no longer a big thing. They find new applications, new uses for this new power they gained. Uh, and they went, well, maybe we don't need to give this up. Maybe we can pass a new law uh, that makes this a permanent authority. And we've seen this happen in country after country. It's not a local uh, domestic issue. And what people are, are missing, that I think people who are looking at this from a longer span are, are catching, is a uh, the coronavirus is a serious problem, but it is a transient problem. Uh, we will eventually have a vaccine, uh, or even if we don't, we will eventually have herd immunity. Uh, in two years, uh, this problem will be gone. Uh, but the consequences of the decision that we make now uh, are permanent. What we have is a transition from government that's looking at us from the outside in mass surveillance. They used to be looking at your phone, right? And they wanted to know what you were clicking on, right? They want to know what you were reading, what you're buying, uh, this kind of associated information. Um, but now when we get into this health context, they want to know, are you ill? They want to know your physical state. They want to know what's happening under your skin. If we permit to uh, say, look, we can track every cell phone of every person everywhere all the time. We can make inferences on the basis of this data set, and then we can take executive actions uh, as a result of this information. What keeps them from going, well, we're worried about health. We're worried about public health. We're worried about protecting people. The primary symptom of the coronavirus is a fever, right? This develops before the cough and persists uh, throughout the course of the virus. It's your immune system fighting it off. Uh, we're going to send an order to every fitness tracker um, that can get something like pulse or heart rate. Uh, and we're going to start demanding access to this kind of activity. Um, and now we're going to go, well, these people have elevated pulses. Uh, and now, you know, five years later, the coronavirus is gone. This data is still available to them. They start looking for new things. They already know what you're looking at on the Internet, right? Uh, they already know uh, where your phone is moving. Now they know what your heart rate is, your pulse is. What happens when they start to intermix these and apply artificial intelligence to it? And Harari asks, uh, if you have this bracelet that tracks your temperature and your pulse, uh, and they know you're watching a video, or uh, you're just watching a speech from a and they see you get angry, right? Uh, because emotions really are biological processes. These are our products that have um, measurable states associated with them by sensors. And they go, well, this person doesn't like what's being said. Uh, it's one thing if an advertiser does this, it's still chilling, it's still dangerous, or a bank does it, or it happens in a job interview. But what happens when you have built, over the course of a generation, the architecture of We are moving closer and closer to that world every day that we let panic motivate our decisions uh, rather than rational reflection regarding inevitable consequences uh, about this narrowing of our rights. We're not being asked for security or privacy. Um, in a free and open society, the thing is we're supposed to say uh, we need both. Uh, and this is derived from the protection of rights. If we begin destroying rights, sacrificing rights in order to improve things, we're actually making things worse. This is changing the world. Uh, some could say the change has already happened. They've got lists about everybody. They've got lists, more lists than Santa Claus. And you're on all of them. You have been hacked. But this is coming and it's coming quickly. These are the things that nobody wants us to know, but everybody needs to know. We wouldn't know about any of this if people weren't willing to take risks to tell us, the public, what is being hidden from us. Whenever a great institution, a great power, a great government is embarrassed uh, or their policies are called into question, in a way that challenges their power um, on a fundamental level, right? Not, not at the edges, uh, not, not in a way they can easily change, but, but something that goes right to the heart of what they claim an authority uh, is that belongs to them and them alone. They say these people are, are traitors. Do you think he's a traitor? I know he damaged the country, and the Obama administration will deal with it. I've got to be careful here, Major, because uh, Mr. Snowden is under indictment. He's been charged with with crimes, and uh, I, I can't weigh in specifically on this case at this point. You think Edward Snowden was a traitor in revealing that? I can never condone what he did. You know, he stole millions of documents. 
And the, you know, the great irony is the vast majority of those documents had nothing to do with American civil liberties, privacy, or anything affecting um, us here at home. They were about information we had vis-a-vis -vis China, Russia, Iran, others. If I am a traitor, as these generals and presidents and all these uh, figures say, the John Kerry's of the world, who is it that I betrayed? The information that I revealed didn't go to the Chinese, it didn't go to the Russians, it didn't go to the Brazilians, it didn't go to the French. It went to American journalists, right? That all made an independent editorial determination. Not just this is what some crazy guy uh, at the NSA thought the world needed to know. Not just Americans, but everyone needed to know. But what the newspapers thought the world needed to know. This is why we have a free press and open societies. The whole reason they exist is to challenge the monopoly on information held by the most powerful and influential members of our society. The only things we know about the worst things they've done is because someone took a risk to tell us. And if telling the public about things of vital democratic importance, right, the boundaries of your rights, the kind of world that you live in, is now treason, uh, it's the act of a traitor, that means the government considers the public the enemy. And if that's the case, that's the side that I want to be on. Uh, this isn't about names, uh, this isn't about programs, this isn't about law, the problem is deeper, it is structural. We, our generation, is witnessing the greatest redistribution of power in civil society since the Industrial Revolution. What does that mean? Exciting words, right? Uh, how did it happen? A generation ago, surveillance was extremely expensive. Uh, every government had to spend extraordinary sums, uh, amounts of money, to track individuals, uh, to know somebody's location. Uh, just their location required teams of officers, uh, both in buildings and out on the streets, uh, that were working across many different shifts. Uh, today, that dynamic is reversed. Uh, one guy sitting in front of a desk, uh, in front of a monitor, you know, in the, in the air conditioning, uh, can now track with precision unimaginably large numbers of people. And this is for the first time in human history uh, that this is really possible, both technically and financially, for both governments and corporations. Start to not just see what an individual is doing, but for the mass of the public. And from the things they see, without even using human eyes, but electronic ones, to start to uh, collate, to collect, uh, index, and, and save nearly complete records of all of our lives, all of our daily activities. It doesn't matter whether you're a criminal, it doesn't matter whether you're an innocent, because under these regimes of bulk collection, uh, as they call them, or mass surveillance, as the public calls them, um, things are collected in advance of suspicion, just in case they think it's interesting later on. And they say, well, if we don't read these things, if we simply collect them, it's not a violation of rights, because a human can look at it, a machine. And the idea of an unconsidered thought the youthful indiscretion, the forgotten mistake. You know, the picture of us drinking uh, when we were younger at a party that our parents didn't know about. Just being among friends, you know, those are starting to sound quaint for a, a forgotten time. Uh, these are things that no longer exist. Mistakes that don't follow us, everything follows us. And think about what that means for just the, the human psyche. Who remembers precisely what they were doing uh, on this evening just a few weeks ago? How about a few months ago? How about a few years ago? None of you, probably. Uh, I don't. But the spies at your intelligence services, they do. They, they've got lists about everybody. They've got lists, more lists than Santa Claus. And you're on all of them. Think about Facebook. Think about Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, he's almost intentionally insulted uh, parliaments in Europe by going, I don't have to answer your questions. I'm too busy. I'll send some, you know, person at the bottom of the corporate structure uh, to go sit in the chair, but my chair will, will be empty. And think about what that means about how he views the world and your place in it. The reality is Facebook doesn't care about you. It doesn't care about your country. It doesn't care about your politics. Uh, it doesn't care about your future or what happens to you. Facebook cares about your data and only your data. They are a surveillance company and their product is you. It is the record of every article that you've ever read that you've ever bothered to click. But it's more than that, it goes deeper. It's the people that you care about and who among them means the most to you. It is the ideas that attract you and the things that repel you. It is a system that is designed 
to observe your life, to calculate the value of it, to crystallize it, to save it, and then to do something with it. It is a system designed to put your mind on a shelf with a price tag that is available to anyone with the money. And it works. Now, some of you might say, well, you know, these are just the things that I put out there online, voluntarily. <laughs> You'd be wrong. Uh, but for the sake of argument, let, let's pretend it's true and move on again, away from government, away from just social media, that kind of corporate surveillance is something more personal. What about the things that you don't choose to share? How many of you in the audience have a smartphone with you right now? You know, an iPhone or an Android phone? It's everyone, right? I want you to imagine uh, that right now, there's a Russian company whose entire business is based around the idea of developing a kind of digital burglary tool. And they go by the name the NSO Group. Uh, their product used to work like this. Uh, they'd send you a time-sensitive text message with a link in it. Uh, something that they think you're likely to click, uh, like a package delivery notification or uh, an alert that one of your family members has died and these are the funeral arrangements uh, and are you going to be there? Uh, and if you click this link, uh, and, and because they can try a hundred different times in a hundred different ways, uh, eventually everyone does, your phone now belongs to whoever sent you that message. You have been hacked by this product. Now the scary thing is because of refinements in this practically criminal product, uh, and it has a real name because this is a real-life example. Uh, it, it's called Pegasus. Uh, it's now being reported that they no longer need you to click anything. Uh, no user interaction is necessary. All they need is your phone number, and they can hack your phone. Now, from that point on, everything in the entire history of that phone, they can instantly and immediately copy. And everything that happens on your phone from that day forward, every place you go, Everyone you call, everything you read, every photograph, or because they can turn on your camera and they can turn on your microphone whenever they want, not just when you want it. Everything that simply passes by that device, everything your phone is a part of, they are now a part of.